One thing Jackie Hino and I share together is I was born in Africa, and that's why I don't venture into cold waters, which my <laughs> wife would venture into swim. And Jackie also still struggles <laughs> with the coolness. But uh, I'm just going to leave my jacket off. <laughs> it's just a uniform, folks. <laughs> At least I'm covered decently, hopefully. <laughs> so let's look into the word of God. Let's come before the Lord and pray together. Father, again, we look to you and we praise you that you've given us your word. You made a door and you've set a path to that door. As the psalmist says, your word is light <laughs> and a lamp to our feet. We look at the world around us and we see the confusion coming more and more all around us. And yet your word is light. As it dispenses darkness, you give us the ability to see so that we may turn to you out from darkness into light. For this we want to thank you. As we take these few moments in the word, Father, would you speak to us? We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are in the series of the book of Romans. So much can be said. I mean, a writer like Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones took I don't know how many years to preach through the book of Romans. Some say five, some say six. Just that one book. The Gospel of Romans confronts mankind, not only the dilemma that mankind is in, but also offers the solution, the only solution for man's welfare. <clears throat> so today I just want to remember I started my uh, first message and went to three Sundays with it. The title was The Gospel, The Good News, and the good news was Jesus our Redeemer. Why do you need a redeemer when things are good for you? When you're the master of your destiny? When you can get out of this life what you want and then die a happy person? Would that be great? That's the blindness that's in the world today. But when you come to scriptures, that blindfold is taken off and you see the reality of life. Can you imagine how many years ago it was when Paul would pen this book to the Romans, to the Christians, to you and to me? And can you imagine that what Paul wrote about is happening right under our feet? Isn't God's word the truth for eternity? So let's very quickly, because of time, look into the second section of Romans chapter 1. Here, I've titled my message, The Problem. And what is the problem? Human depravity. Now, we don't like using that word because we all want to think, I'm a good person. And so and so, my family are good people. But the Bible has got a different estimation. And that estimation has to be dealt with according to God's word. Remember the key verses I put down for this uh, section of our study is Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. Paul will go and say, For I am not ashamed of the good news, the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Please take note of God's word. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, and also to the Greeks or barbarians or Gentiles. Verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And then I go to Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What powerful words if you just let the Holy Spirit uh, melt these words in your mind and in your heart. 
So how do we begin this section? This section is a hard section. For Paul lines out where man is, minus Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection on the cross of Calvary. So we begin with the willful blindness of the heathen. And guess what? Each one of us sitting here today were once regarded as heathens without Christ. Now some of you, your parents might have taken you to church. You might have a little inclination about God's truth and all that. But can I say to you, everyone was born in sin. David, who was not a scientist, he didn't have a degree in biology major. Guess what? He says, I was knit in my mother's womb. But in sin, I was conceived. From Adam down to the very last person, we are born in sin. And guess what sin will do? It pulls you away from God. So what is Paul trying to say to us? Well, he talks about the willful blindness of the heathen. Chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. It's funny, before I really gave my heart to the Lord, the Bible was so confusing. I, it made no sense. My mother would read to us scriptures, or she'd take Bible stories. I loved the stories, but it made no sense to me. But then when I became a believer, God pulled the masks off. God pulled the blindness off. And I could see who I really am. So here Paul outlines. You see, you may think, well, you know, people, uh, pastor, it's not fair. Because people in these distant lanes have no idea, do not understand about Christ and about God. Can I say to you, I was born in Africa. I went in the dark villages of Africa. And even there, an African man had a knowledge that there is a power that's above him. Amen. That always baffled me. You go in the most remote areas of India. The person has a conscience that there is a power that is above him. Though it is distorted, because of sin. But yet, man has an inclination towards something we call God. How does that happen? Well, if you believe in evolution, that you're just a monkey that just evolved, then there is no God. Then you are just being perfected by the process of evolution. But I'll tell you, even that falls very short when you look at mankind. Because the more enlightened we become, the better we should be. But yet, what do you find in the evolutionary mold? The more the man knows, the more vicious he becomes. So it just breaks down. And then you come to the idea of creation. God created us. And the Bible says he created us in his image. There is something God imparted in mankind that has got to come back to God. So, we begin with God's witness is unmist unmistakable. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Each person has some knowledge of God. We all originate from one couple. Whether you like it or not, I'm related to you and you're related to me. Whether I say I've got a better tan than you, it doesn't matter. I'm related to you, you're related to me. Because according to Bible, there was only one male, one female that God created. And we have all originated from that. So here, in Acts, uh, Genesis 10, you can read this. Um, I, I will let you go to Genesis 10 yourself, but let me just read one verse 
Acts chapter 17, verse 26. The Bible says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of the dwelling place. So the truth is, the whole world fell into sin because of Adam and Eve. And guess what? If left in that predicament, you and I should not be sitting here. Because right in the Garden of Eden, we were condemned. God's witness is unmistakable. And that's why Paul was able to write, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And you see how even truth is being suppressed. You know, sometimes we look to the political entities and we think they are going to be our savior. Can I say to you, there is no salvation. And politicians, I don't care which color they wear, cannot save you, cannot save me. There's only one who can save you from the wrath, and that is God himself. Not only is God's witness unmistakable, God's witness is universal. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. You know, sometimes I just sit and I think about my eyes. I like mechanical things because I can pull it apart to be back together. But then I think about the eyes and I think about the ear. Man, I think, what kind of a designer sat behind the desk to make the eye, to make the ears, how it functions? Um, one of the men I really love the best neurosurgeon the uh, United States has ever produced was Dr. Ben Carson. And by the way, he's a Christian. Yeah. Amen. You know, there has not been another neurosurgeon with the ability that God has given this one man. And he's a believer because through it he found God's creative act and enabled him to save so many lives. So, in Romans 1, uh, verse, uh, chapter 1 verse 20 Paul writes for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse now you know what God's invisible attributes we all are exposed to it mm. I sit down and I think that tree in my yard was full of green leaves. And it created just a level of beauty and shade that there was sometime during this summer that shade was wonderful. And then now comes the season, the change of season. And the colors. Mm -hmm. I just told my wife yesterday, the sun shining through that uh, maple tree behind the kitchen there, the, sun, the leaves were golden. It's almost like somebody went and took gold paint and painted all those leaves. And then as soon as it has had this beautiful color, it will fall. And the tree is going to go to sleep. Which man can create that? Which entity could create that? But God did it. And that is his witness to you and me. His witness is universal. Every man uh, in Africa, in India, in Europe, you name it, are exposed to it. And all men are exposed by it. You know how we are exposed by it? We try to change nature. How successful have we been? I laughed at one of the, the leaders of the United States of America. He said, we are going to take control of the hurricanes that come through, and we are going to manage it. Guess what? To date, the failure rate has been 100%. All they do is pick up after. Because you see, when God unleashes his power, no man can stand to it. We are exposed to it. 
All men are exposed to it. That's why I read Psalms 19. You see in Psalms 19 that David would, would sit back and write, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes up through all the earth, and the words to the ends of the earth. In them He has set a tent for the sun. We see the willful blindness of the heathen. We see the wicked beliefs of the heathen. First we see the inflation of men's own godless imagination. And folks, we've got children in this sanctuary. And I could reveal to you so much of the godless things that are happening all around us. Romans chapter 1 verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and in their foolish heart were darkened. The moment your thinking is obscured, it affects your heart. You see, man has become consciously irreligious. There is a further moving away from God as maker. There's an advertisement I get on my internet all the time that this man has come <coughs> You see, first we had Darwin, who said man just evolved. Well, time and time again, it has caught up in their throats, and they don't even know how to throw it out. And now has come Tar Darwin number two. Another man has come up and said, he has the solution for the world. And the people who testified said, at last there's somebody who's come up with the solution for the world. I'm saying, then why don't you unleash it and see where he goes? They keep talking about it, but they cannot do anything about it. So, they knew God, but they did not honor Him as God, or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Man has become consci uh, consciously irreligious. Look at the uh, first part of verse 21. For they knew God, they did not honor Him. You see, human science and philosophy make belief in God unnecessary. Do you realize that? When the scientists discovered the genetic code, you know what they ended up in the conclusion of what British Genesis said? Now we can create man. They've tried. All that is helping them is silicon rubber and few parts of computerized machinery. Human has become consequently irrational. You know the foolishness. Sometimes I see adults and the foolish things they do. I begin to wonder. Please forgive me for, for saying this. But sometimes like somebody said to me recently, my dog has got more sense than that man. <laughs> I was offended with what he said. But what he said was true. You know, and you see it all around. I'm being very careful. I've never seen a rooster lay an egg. When I go to babysit my son's farm, the hands are clucking away because they've laid an egg. You see, the foolishness of men has been so pervasive in our society. Man has become consequently irrational. The man who has, you see, man has dethroned God from his intellect and become conceited and, and stupid or unintelligent and foolish. You see, we have the field of molecular biology unfolding the basic genetic patterns that shape every living thing on earth. So some scientists believe that they can create life. So therefore it eradicates the belief in God. Can I say to you, if it was possible to eradicate belief in God, you would have the power to destroy the world completely. And nobody has got the power to destroy the world. 
only God does. You say, but pastor, what about the nuclear bombs and all that? Can I say to you, those are little toys. Only when God says, it is finished, it will be finished. So on whose side should you, you and I be leaning on? The influence of man's own godless imagination. Then we see the influence of man's own graven images. Remember when they made the Titanic? <laughs> Titanic was never supposed to sink. It was the mothership of all time. What did it take to sink the Titanic people? Frozen water. <laughs> Frozen water. You see, the influence of men's own graven images, the ideal, the idol is conceived by the men. So listen to what the word says in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Worldly wisdom leads one to be Forgive me the word, but it's a true word, moron. Fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. no God. So you see what has happened. I've read this story just because of time. I'm going to make it very quick. Um, I was young, got the first time to travel, go to Belgium for a Christian conference. And there, there was an opportunity to do board a ship and go to India. And I want to go to India because that's where my father and grandfather came from. So I was so eager to go there, and I am rushing to sign up my name so I can work on the boat and find my way to India. And somebody stops me and said, young man, do you know that if you go to India, you better be prepared. There are so many idols, and behind those idols, there are demonic powers. Well, having grown in Africa and having been involved in a little bit of witchcraft and all that, that was enough to say, no, no, I better rethink that. I cannot remember the man's face, I just remember his words. And that turned me around not going to India on the free ride. See, I wanted the free ride. God knew my heart. So can I say to you, you see, worldly wisdom leads one to be fool. And you know what is even said, and I say this without a blinking an eye, Sometimes we as Christians have become fools. And I'll tell you how we become fools. We said, well, I'm going to serve God this way. So that I can keep my goodies and still serve God. And then justify in my mind, I'm all right. You see, the problem with, with, with the Christian life is God sets the way. You say, but doesn't he call me to serve him? Yes. He sets the premise of how you're going to serve him. And that's how you're going to live for him. You don't set up your own premise. And many a times I find that we have made our own little idol. We want our God that fits in our back pocket. So what I want from God, I can get it. But then what I want from my own life, I can do it. You see, he sets the rules. And folks, one of the things that I struggled in my Christian walk was... I wanted to set my own rules and still have a Christian walk. It never worked. In fact, it led me to great despair and a lot of pain. So enough said, the influence of men's own graven images. The man is deceived by an idol, verses uh, 24. Therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Look around us, people. What's happening? And that's what this man was discussing with me when he said to me, my God, my, my dog has got more sense than human beings. And I had to agree what he said. Verse 25, not only his sensual enslavement, means my senses have been enslaved by the things of this world. His spiritual enslavement. Verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And time and time again I find 
You know, like the celebrities have their red carpet. Do you see people clamoring just to see another human being in some kind of uh, clothing that you wonder you could afford to buy them a better clothing than what they are wearing on that red carpet? But do you see how people clamor? And what do they get out in the end? Nothing but foolishness. So you see, we are blinded and we have been spiritually enslaved because we exchange the truth of God for the lie and we worship the creation instead of the creator. There is no one entity in the world like Asians from Asia and India that worship. Do you know how many gods there are in India? Over 3,000. <laughs> Boy, talk of variety. Talk of choice. What does Christianity offer you? One God, one way, one Jesus Christ, the only one who died and rose from the grave. But look how many churches are now beginning to embrace New Age movement. It sometimes makes me wonder. Psalms 106, verses 35 to 38. But they mixed with the nations, and they learned to do as they did. This is talking about the children of Israel, who was given God's covenant and great miracles in uh, rescuing them. The psalmist writes, they served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons, and they poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. You see, at the end of the day, when man turns away from God, he becomes like an animal himself. Verse 39, Psalms 106. Thus they became unclean by their acts and played the whore in their deeds. Leviticus 17, 17. So they shall no more sacrifice the sacrifices to the goat demons, after whom they chase after. Mm -hmm. Interesting word. This shall be a statue forever for them throughout their generation. When I was in Israel, I went to the place where they used to worship goats. The god was half goat, half man. And they had his statue uh, carved out in stone. They kept sacred go goats there. And there were atrocities that were down there. Mm -hmm. So this thing, that is being written in our scripture is not something that hasn't happened, has happened. And the demise that it brought in that area was amazing. The destruction it brought. You see, we were created for God. The base is this. You were created for God. You were created to have fellowship with him for eternity. Satan came and robbed us. He didn't rob God, he robbed us of that relationship. And what does God do? Oh, I make a new set of people better than the first model. Remember this new electrical car coming out, coming out folks. You won't need gas. And we think better, the newer is better. But can I say to you, God by his love and mercy turned around and rescued you and me. He didn't have to. He did it out of his love and mercy. I would rather follow a God that can love me so much then follow a God of my own making that is only suitable for certain parts of my worship. And when I don't want to worship him, then I can follow my own desires because the ending is very dangerous. So finishing the last point, but before I do that, I want to go to Isaiah 40, 28. It's an amazing portion of scripture. Isaiah is writing, and look how Isaiah writes to his people and really to us. In verse 28, Isaiah 40, 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And then in verse 29, he says, He gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall fall exhausted. 
but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word, but they that wait for the Lord. You know what waiting is? When you sit on the Lord and you allow Him to carry you, you will not grow weary. But sit in your own strength. See how far you will get. Lastly, the wanton behavior of the heathen. And this is so prevalent in our day today that when I read this uh, passage and I began to look at the world around me and look, I I'll tell you, the depravity that has come to mankind is beyond words. The wanton behavior of the heathen, Paul lists out very quickly. First he says they have become morally perverted. Verses 26 and 27. <laughs> For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions for the women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature and the men likewise gave up their natural relationship with uh, relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error we go through round one We've gone through round two, and yet it seems there is even more persistence now to turn away from what God has made us to be. And really, the battle is not against me and them or them against you. The battle is against God's very creative act. One, one preacher said to a man, if God made you a man, then be a man. Such a simple statement, almost sounds stupid. But what a profound statement. If God made you a man, be a man. If God made you a woman, be a woman. But see what the enemy wants. He wants us to throw away the creative power of God and try to change us. You know, and this has been a long time coming. The worst part of it, what I read about, it has now even entered the church of Jesus Christ. Watch out, people. The unnatural sins of men. We don't have to even go in depth of that. Look around you today. The unnatural sins of women. Look around you. Now what, 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 what is the church supposed to do? Hate them? No. No. When the Bible tells me, love my enemies. You see, the Bible does not throw that command to me, love my enemies. The Bible empowers me to love. And that's the only way I can love those who are outside the circle of faith. You see, because that brings me back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world. And what did he do? He said, I really love them, but man, I don't know what I love for them. He gave his only begotten son. The most precious, the highest of the price God paid to redeem you and me. So, you see what is happening with the world today. What you see what's happening around you is fighting at against the very creative act of God. And what a perversion is brought. Very quickly. Since they do not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. Verse 28 of Romans 1. They became mentally perverted. In fact, if you talk to psychologists and psychiatrists, mm -hmm. they said that now they're dealing with an epidemic of mental issues. And you know where it's beginning? It's beginning with our children. And it's going to adults. Where did it begin? And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, they are gossips, slanderers, 
hater of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And then he ends with this verse. Though they know God's righteous decree, and that those who practice such things deserve to die, that not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. The cause of wrong thinking will always lead to perversion of the heart and mind and spirit. But then there's consequences of the wrong thinking. Debased human character. Debased human character. I don't know what it is nowadays. There were conservative news outlets that you would not hear a swear word. But my goodness, they have become worse. You know, I, I cannot, in good stead, sit with my son or my daughter or my grandchildren and listen to news anymore. And this was the conservative uh, news thing. You wonder what's happened to mankind, what's happened to human being. Debased human character. Debased human conduct. How we behave. Debased human conversation. I mean, I go to places and I see this beautifully attired woman. And then she opens her mouth, and it's almost like lady. Did your parents forget to wash your mouth? <laughs> it really destroys the beauty that that person had, just by what they're saying and how they're saying it, and then debased human concepts. You see, when God is removed out of your life, you will look at another human being in a very different way. Debased human concepts and then debased human companionship. You will not follow God's way of having a companionship that brings honor to Him. You will find a companionship of your suiting, the one that will fall in the line of your thinking. Isn't it amazing, the world we are living in? It is pervasive throughout our land. People, when I meet African brethren, they said, what is happening to the Western world? Because you see, they consider Canada and U.S. to be a Christian country. And what do you say? The moment you and I walk away from God, the maker, we become worse than the animals on this earth. So what's the solution? Well, see how Paul is going to bring this issue to the forefront to help us understand and work and destroy the power of human depravity. And you know what? You want to see the level of human depravity? Go to our jail systems. We think by incarcerating few people and restricting them from going out to the outside world, that they'll come out reformed. People are coming out from our jails 20, 30 years later, and they're still just as vicious and wild as they ever were. There is nothing can change the heart of men except Jesus Christ and his shed blood on Calvary's cross. And the moment the church compromises on that message, You've already lost your way. Then it is your church. It is not Christ's church. Because Christ's church has been purchased by his blood. Amen. And he's the only one who can take the depravity that's in your heart, in my heart. He's the only one who can refine my heart from that depravity. I have no power in myself to remove that depravity. Because in sin I was born. That's very clear from what the psalmist says. I have no power over sin, which will eventually lead me to death, separated from God for eternity. The only way I can deal with this depravity is Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And that's why he had to come in the human flesh, go on Calvary's cross, die for your sin, die for my sin, and then bring us back to the Father. And whom he saves. You know what's the amazing thing? He'll keep until that great redemption day. Praise God that human depravity is seen all around, but the one who can break the depravity is Jesus Christ our Lord. So why don't we worship him? Why don't we live for him? Why don't we strive every day to live 
more and more for him and him alone until the day he comes to claim us. Praise God. This time we're going to ask 